of homeopathic medicine is in fact just water with sugar, to be fair. <laughs>What we're going to talk about today is actually what it is a philosophy of life. I'm going to start that way, and then we'll talk about skepticism in particular. I think that a philosophy of life has three components. It has a metaphysics, which is essentially an account of how the world works. I'll give you an example or, or two in a minute. There is an ethics, which is an account of how we should live in the world, given how the world is. In other words, the two are connected, right? Uh, in order to figure out how to live your life, how to behave with other people, uh, you need to know something about how the world is actually put together, hangs together. And then usually, although not always, there is a set of practices uh, to help you implement those two things, particularly the ethics. The ethics is the, is the practical part. For example, so let's say, for instance, Christianity, uh, which is a religion, but I, I contend that religions are, in fact, types of philosophies of life. There is really not fundamental difference there. Well, in terms of the metaphysics, of course, there is a more or less benevolent God, depending if you're looking at the Old Testament or the New Testament, uh, who created the world, is outside of the world itself, etc., etc. Uh, in terms of ethics, uh, you can refer to the Ten Commandments, to the teachings of Jesus, uh, the apostles, and, set, and, and so on. And in terms of practices, you pray, you have communal activities, you are you know, reading scriptures and stuff like that, right? And you can go through the other two lines. The same is for Buddhism, for Stoicism, for any kind of other uh, philosophy or religion. So this is what it means. This is what we're talking about today, uh, to have or follow a religion or philosophy of life. Now, when it comes to skepticism in particular, skeptics don't have a, particular, a good reputation necessarily. This, the, the cartoon says, welcome National Society of Skeptics. The guy on the left says, I don't believe we met. The one on the right says, I don't believe you don't believe we met. You know, skeptics is all, no, eh, I don't really believe anything. But of course, that actually not what skepticism is about, and I'll try to convince you in the next few minutes that uh, that is, in fact, a caricature, uh, not, not the real thing. In fact, the word skeptic comes from the Latin skepticus, which itself is derived from the Greek skeptikos, and those words mean inquirer, or somebody who reflects on things and tries to learn with an open mind. So a skeptic is not somebody who says, has a knee-jerk reaction every time you tell him something and says, no, 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 no. It's actually somebody who says, okay, let's take a look. And by taking a look, as we'll see in the next few minutes, mostly that means, well, what are your arguments and what is your evidence uh, for why I should believe X, Z, or, or Y? Skepticism has a long history. And most of the initial part of that history, of course, is uh, characterized by a bunch of uh, dead wine men. But that is changing, as you'll see in a minute. Arguably, it started out in the Western tradition with Socrates in the 5th century uh, BCE. And then you'll see a number of people there who will encounter again in a minute, uh, Piero of Elis, Carneades, Marcus Tullius Cicero, uh, all the way into the late antiquity with Sextus Empiricus. Then you skip the Middle Ages, no skeptics in the Middle Ages, basically. Um, because if you were a skeptic in the Middle Ages, you'd likely be burned to death. Um, or subjected to other such unpleasant uh, situations. So we get to the Renaissance directly, and we have people like Michel de Montaigne, René Descartes, the famous, I think, therefore I am, uh, Baruch Spinoza, and most importantly, probably, arguably, David Hume. Now, as I said, you probably noticed that these are all dead, mostly white men, uh, but the situation has been improving recently, uh, if we're talking about modern skepticism, 20th, 21st century skepticism, you can see here and you know, popping up a few women like Susan Gerbeck, Harriet Hall, Carl Tavares, Eugenie Scott. Actually, there's a lot more of that. But this is pretty much the arc, the historical arc we're talking about. This is an almost continuous tradition, except for the Middle Ages, uh, from the 5th century BCE up until literally now. There are two fundamentally different, and yet I will argue in the next few minutes, also fundamentally related types of skepticism. Let's refer to them from now on as ethical skepticism and scientific skepticism. Ethical skepticism, in a sense, refers to the second of those components of a philosophy of life that I was talking about, that is, how do you live your life? Ethics, especially for the Greco-Romans, was really the study of how to live your life. It wasn't just about determining what is right or what is wrong in any particular action. It was more broadly an issue of, you know, what should I do in life? And, what kind of priorities should I have? 
how should I behave with other people? That's ethical skepticism. And then there is scientific skepticism, which is really has to do with the first component uh, that I was talking earlier, the metaphysics. Not metaphysics as, we, um, as understood today, you know, philosophical zombies, panpsychism, and all that sort of nonsense. Sorry. Uh, but rather metaphysics in the sense of, as I said, a picture of the world. Today we call it science. Okay? Not, not really metaphysics in the, in, the, in the original sense. What I like to convince you of, among other things, is that, first of all, the two are actually not that different. That, that once you see them from the point of view of a skeptic, both ethics and, and science actually fall into the same general kind of domain. And second, secondarily, that, that it's actually time to bring back a new form of skepticism or, or originate a new form of skepticism where the two are actually merged uh, into one coherent view, more or less coherent view of the world. If you're a skeptic, you can't say that you definitely are going to have a coherent view of the world. You should say, you know, more or less, probably. So let's start with ethical skepticism. And we here need to go very briefly to antiquity, to the period in ancient classical uh, Rome and, and Greece. There were essentially two types of skepticism. I'm going to introduce both of them, and then we're going to abandon one because it's less relevant to what we're going to talk about today. But for the sake of completeness, I, I think I should mention both of them. One is actually referred to, I'll talk about it from now on, as Pyrrhonism uh, or Pyrrhonian skepticism, but Pyrrhonism is actually uh, uh, a better, a short, shorthand. Uh, started out with that guy on the left, who was Pyrrho, and, uh, and then later on, the major author, left antiquity, Sexus and Pyrrhicus. The other one is referred to as academic skepticism, academic because it actually took over Plato's academy after Plato had died. And from now on, I'll refer to it as just skepticism without the academic part, okay? So, Pyrrhonism, skepticism, but they're both kinds, types of skepticism. And major people there are Carneades, you see on the left of the right, and then Cicero. So how do they differ? Well, they differ in three major respects. First of all, in terms of what philosophers call, the, call epistemology, that is how, a theory of knowledge. How do we know things? Do we know things in the first place? But how do, and, and if so, how? Uh, for the Pyrrhonists, there is in fact no firm support for any kind of opinions, which they have heard that to as dogmas, outside of evident matters. That is, you know, there are some things that are kind of evident and we don't really need to waste our time talking about it. For instance, it's pretty evident that I'm here talking to you guys and that there is a certain number of people here. Sure, we could entertain the possibility that I'm actually living in the matrix and, uh, or I'm a brain in a vat and all that, but why? There's really no particular reason for doing that. This is evident. But then there are non-evident matters. How you should live your life is a non-evident matter. It can be debated. There is a question, it's a complex question of evidence, arguments, etc., etc. And basically the Pyrrhonists rejected anything that had to do with non-evident matter. They say, you know what, if it comes to that, you really don't know what you're talking about. You don't have enough reasons uh, to back up your dogmas. The, do the word was dogma, which in, in, in the ancient world just meant opinion. The Academic skeptics, on the other hand, say, no, you, you can have a certain, you can have opinions, and in fact, some opinions are be better than others. You probably will never arrive at certain knowledge. We had yesterday a panel actually debating the concept of certain, certainty and, and, and knowledge. You might not uh, have it, you might never get there because human beings, you know, what, how do we get knowledge? We get knowledge from our senses and from our reason, and both of them are fallible. We, we know that sometimes either reason or our senses or both can actually lead us to the wrong conclusion. So they're fallible. So we're never sure. That doesn't mean, however, that every opinion is created equal. There are some things that are far more probable than others, more, more, more convincing than others. And so the sensible thing to do is to follow whatever it is that appears to be more uh, likely. Now, in terms of practice, the two schools also differed. The Pyrrhonists said that we should suspend judgment on anything that is non-evident. So because you don't have knowledge, because you don't have any particular reason to, to uh, go one way or the other, you should just engage in suspension of judgment. Now, even though I'm not a Pyrrhonist, I think this is a great idea. Today, we, we seem to be so damn sure about almost everything, even though we don't, usually don't have any good reasons to be damn sure. And uh, we are so judgmental, we tell other people that they should be living their lives in a different way, that we're, that we're absolutely certain. So, you know, suspension of judgment, that's actually, at least as an exercise, it's not a bad idea. As far as the academic skeptics are concerned, 
well, what happens in terms of practice, you arrive at tentative opinions based on probability. The Greek word was pitanon, which interestingly, uh, Cicero translated in Latin as probabilis, which is the root for the English probability. So you go after, you, you, know, you practice what is probable. You, you act on the basis of what appears to you to be probable, given the, the facts that you have available. Should the facts change or should the, your understanding of the facts change, then you're going to change uh, your way of acting. And then finally, in terms of ethics, that is, you know, okay, so how do, how do I behave, therefore, in general? What is my goal in life? For the Pyrrhonists, the goal of life is tranquility of mind. Sounds boring, but, you know, a lot of people go after it. It's like, all right, I want to be serene, tranquil, and the best way to do that is to suspend judgment. Why? Because we are attached to our judgments. Our identity uh, depends on our judgments. And so when, we, when our judgments and our opinions are challenged by somebody, we take it as a personal offense. And that creates, you know, we get really upset and railed up and all that sort of stuff. So the notion here is like, if you want to be serene and tranquil in your life, just let go of all those opinions. Don't attach them to your ego and you're going to be fine. Easier said than done. But it's not a bad idea. As far as the academic skeptics are concerned, on the other hand, we should just live uh, like many other Greco-Roman schools suggested. That is, by practicing uh, one of the four cardinal virtues known as practical wisdom. You're basically going to do whatever seems more likely, more probable, more effective, and more just. And that depends, because uh, it is based on opinions. The opinion, your opinions themselves are based on probability. Your probabilities will change throughout life. So there is no general rule. For living, it's just you have to make it up as you go. Sounds familiar. So as I said, we're going to focus on this one from now on. Now, what about scientific skepticism, the second type of skepticism that I was talking about, the first one being ethical? Well, it's been defined in a number of ways by different authors. Here's Paul Kurtz in a book called that came out in 1992 called The New Skepticism. He said, briefly stated, a skeptic is one who is willing to question any claim to truth asking for certainty, for clarity, sorry, in definitions, consistency in logic, and adequacy evidence. In other words, show me the evidence. You know, if, you're claiming, if you're claiming X, I'd like to know why you're claiming X. On what basis are you making that claim? Carl Sagan, in uh, 1995, in a book called The Demon Hunted World, said that the question is not whether we like the conclusion that emerges out of a train of reasoning, but whether the conclusion follows from the premises or starting point, and whether the premise, is, the premise is true. In other words, it doesn't matter what you'd like to be true. Uh, it, what matters is what you think is true based on evidence, based on questioning your own premises, and so on and so forth. That, that's, that's what scientific skepticism is largely about. Scientific skepticism has a huge span of application. These are some examples. Um, up to the left, for instance, telepathy. Uh, the center top uh, eugenics, the, the notion that you could, you could and should breed human beings for Im improvement. Uh, Bigfoot, astrology, uh, that, ca that guy in the middle says, uh, his sign says global warming is a socialist scam, so we're talking about climate change. Just say no to vaccines, um, defend your freedom with that. This, this has become particularly relevant uh, during, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, UFOs. That just water thing refers to homeopathy, because homeopathic medicine is, in fact, just water with sugar, to be fair. <laughs> and the last one is Jesus uh, riding a dinosaur that represents creationism, which I know you guys think, what the hell is that? But in the United States, it's a big deal. So this is the kind of stuff that typically scientific skeptics are concerned with. Uh, okay, so to, to analyze these kind of claims and say, well, why do you think that there is, in fact, such a thing as telepathy, for instance? Or why do you think that we should not take uh, vaccines and so on and so forth? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.